Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Heidi Taylor Caudle and I'm the new uh, Collections and Community Engagement Manager with Historic New Harmony. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming tonight uh, to hear the talk by uh, Dr. Michael Straczynski uh, for the Harmonist Connection. If I mispronounced your name, I'm very sorry. I'm horrible. You wouldn't be the first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Harmonist Connection is sponsored uh, by Historic New Harmony, Old Economy Village, and Historic Harmony. And so the whole idea behind it is that we find a topic that is uh, common to all three sites that connect us. Uh, we usually host a few of these virtual talks uh, every year, and then we post the recordings on our YouTube channel, which I've uh, put the, the link into the chat. Uh, so you can see some of our other uh, previous talks. And this one will be recorded and go on YouTube um, in a few days, hopefully. Uh, I will, yeah, I've already put the, uh, the link in the chat. Uh, be sure to check out the other talks. Uh, there's some good topics there about gardens and town planning and uh, different things like that. And we've got a good lineup for next year uh, in the works as well. Uh, Dr. Strzeski. Strzeski, I'm so sorry, uh, <laughs> is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Southern Indiana. Uh, he's been working at New Harmony since 2008, and he's conducted uh, various excavations um, at different sites, including Community House Number 1 and Number 2, uh, the Fauntleroy House, the Harmonist uh, Kiln, and the Harmonist Frame Church. Uh, he's the author of this book. We want to promote that. Uh, Christoph uh, Weber, uh, Redware Potter of the Harmony Society, 1808 to 1853. Uh, that was published in 2023 as part of Hamilton College's American Communal Society series. Uh, you can purchase the book at any of our uh, museum shops or from the Hamilton College website. And if you know of any other places where people could uh, buy the book, uh, let us know. Uh, thank you uh, for sharing your knowledge about Christoph Weber and the Harmony, Harmony Society with us tonight. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks for that introduction. Um, let's go ahead and share the screen here. All right. How's that look? Looks good. You see it? Okay, great. Um, all right, there we go. So yeah, um, <clears throat> as far as buying the book, if you want to try to buy it online, if you just look up Cooper Press, it's C-O-U-P-E-R, Cooper Press, um, and it's uh, it's it's on there. It'll, it'll pop up in Google. You can find it pretty easily. Um, so today I am going to talk about Christoph Weber uh, and the manufacture of Redware Pottery in the Harmony Society, right? Um, so this is a talk uh, that does encompass all three towns, really. Um, you know, it's just like I said, kind of ties them all together there because uh, Weber was an early uh, member of the Harmony Society and he lived through uh, all three towns, right? He started out in Harmony, Pennsylvania during the first decade. He came to New Harmony. Uh, Harmony, Indiana for that decade in Indiana. And then he went back to Pennsylvania and he lived out his life, the remainder of his life in, in economy. So it does encompass, uh, he was making pottery at the, the Harmony Society for at least 45 years, right? So, you know, one of the big questions is uh, why, why pottery? Why redware? Why am I interested in this in the first place? And it has a lot to do with the fact that I'm an archaeologist. And as an archaeologist, I have to dig all of my information out of the ground. And so, um, you know, a large uh, portion of uh, items that uh, are, are, are shown in this photo, for example, or this drawing, which says a street view and economy, would not survive to the present day, right? So any of the clothing that the harmonists are wearing there, um, tools, wheelbarrow, baskets, you know, any and any other things that the harmonists made, shoes, rope, saddles, wagons, you know, all that sort of stuff is perishable. And uh, for an archaeologist, we like to stick with things that 
you know, we can actually observe, which are imperishable things. And pottery, although it breaks, it winds up in the ground and it's and, it, and you can recover it and study it. And so it's one of the very few things that we could, for example, in New Harmony, where I work, um, we could actually say that this was made by the harmonists, right? This town was occupied for two, has been, you know, occupied for more than 200 years now. And these are one of the very few artifacts that we can actually pin down easily to the Harmony Society, right? So redware pottery um, is is the first pottery that was made in, in the pioneer era United States. Typically, when folks first started settling in a particular area, they started making redware pottery. And it's a type of pottery that's made from very common clays uh, that are uh, found in, in a lot of different places. Um, and um, so when you set up a, a new town or new settlement of some kind, people need to have ceramics, they need to have pottery. And so they will uh, fill that void, those redware potteries, right? So this pottery, click on here. There we go. Uh, basically what it is, is the density of a flower pot and it has the, the, the heft of a flower pot as well. Um, and um, it's basically the same plays that they would use for making flower pots, right? Uh, now, a redware pottery is typically glazed with lead uh, on the interior and sometimes on the exterior. Now, for obvious reasons, we don't use lead anymore to glaze pottery, right? Um, but it was a, a good... Uh, material for glazing uh, vessels. And it was used all the way, you know, going all the way back to Roman times and that sort of thing. So it had been used for thousands of years for as a glaze. Um, and, and there was two reasons that you would glaze the inside of the pot, especially, was number one, it, because this was like a flower pot, it was going to be porous, right? If I just, if it was unglazed and we put water in it, the water would soak up into the walls of the vessel. And that's not good, right? You know, if you're going to put food in there or butter or something like that, you don't want it all soaked up into the walls of the vessel. And so you glaze the inside of it. So that was one you know, reason that the glaze was, was put on there. The other was just to make it easier to clean. You could wipe the inside of it and it'd be nice and cleaned out. Um, so it's it's not so much a, uh, a uh, uh, an aesthetic choice, but more of a utilitarian one, right? So the types of pottery that uh, redware potters were making typically are more of the utilitarian types, storage jars, uh, jugs, um, you know, a variety of mixing bowls for around the kitchen, that kind of thing. Things that were just kind of day-to-day -day sorts of vessels that you would need around the house, right? Not so much uh vessels that were maybe used on the table although we'll see some exceptions here um in this talk so christoph faber was born in germany in uh, 1784 and um he uh was born in a town called Fortsheim, which is in modern day you know southwest germany and it's you can see in this uh right here where it says uh, we can see Fort Sign there. It's right next to Iptingen, where where Rapp was from, and that's probably the way that he was made familiar with Rapp's teachings and decided, at you know, to to move to the United States to follow Rapp. Um, now we don't know, uh, you know, the, the, one of the things, one of the problems I might say with with the Harmony Society is that we just don't know a lot about the individuals within the society, right? You know, we've got names and we've got. Uh, oftentimes birth dates and death dates and who they married and all sorts, sorts of things. Uh, but, you know, there's not much out there that says like who this person was, like individual sorts of little bits of information about them as a person, right? And that's, I think, is kind of uh, unfortunate because these are the people that made up the backbone of the Harmony Society. We just don't know a lot about them. And so one of the things I tried to do in this book is to... Uh, is to 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 kind of humanize Weber a little bit to try to make him a person by gathering as much little bits and pieces of information as I could about him, right? So here's a few just little biographical facts, let's say. And I, as I showed here, this anonymous head, <laughs> this anonymous male head, because we just don't know what he looked like. There's no drawings or photos of him. Uh, but he arrived in the United States in 1805, and at that time, his occupation was listed as potter. So we do know that he studied the craft in Germany before he came to the United States. Um, in 1806, he married uh, Maria Rostan, um, and she was another harmonist. Uh, she had come to uh, the United States in 1804. 
four, if I remember correctly, with her family, her parents and some siblings. Um, and as far as I know, Weber and Maria didn't know, uh, Christoph and, and Maria didn't know one another before they came to the United States, but they uh, met and, and decided to get married in 1806. And this would have been just before the harmonists put that rule in place that, you know, folks weren't supposed to get married. So they got, you know, just under the under the line on that one. Um, and then the next year in 1807, they had a son uh, whose name was uh, Elias, right? And that's the only child that they had. So the first records we have of him making any pottery were from Harmony, Pennsylvania, the first town. Um, and we have some records from 1808. He may have been making pottery earlier than that. I just don't have any documentary evidence for it. So, you know, if there's kind of a three year gap there between when he arrives and when we have evidence for him actually working his craft. Um, but in 1808, we have some uh, records that indicate uh, he was ordering supplies uh, for, for pottery making, in particular lead, uh, which was a major supply that he needed to, to do this. Unfortunately, um, his wife died uh, not too long after they came to New Harmony. Uh, and she was one of the harmonists. I mean, if you know anything about the history of the Harmony Society, it was a big, uh, uh, quite, a, quite a few harmonists that died right as soon as they came to uh, Indiana. Uh, there was some type of a fever that was going around and she was one of the people that died from that fever. Um, apparently, uh, so I've seen some documents that indicate that, that Weber went to the doctor and said, you know, is there anything you can do for my wife? She's sick. And he gave her some uh, uh, quinine, which was, uh, you know, medicine for malaria, but apparently it didn't do it, uh, what it was intended to do. And she wound up uh, dying. She's buried in New Harmony. So after that point, uh, Weber continued to, you know, practice his craft um, until 1853, at which point he seems to have retired. That's the last record we have of manufacture of pottery. Um, and then in 1861, uh, Weber died. Now, uh, the thing about Christoph Weber is that we know that um, he died uh, by suicide. He, he uh, is the only harmonist that I know of uh, that, that died in that manner. Um, and the reason that we know that, uh, there's a mention of it in one of John Duss's uh, books, but there's also a uh, photo in the archives at uh, Old Economy of a harmonist house. And on the back of the photo, somebody had written, um, House midway between 15th and 16th West Side of Church Street. My family lived here from 1888 to 1890 while I was teaching, while I was teacher, right? The society's last potter, Christoph Weber, he shot himself in 1861, used this house as a warehouse for his pottery, right? And that's all the information I have as to what happened. Um, I don't know why he would have done something like that. I have a hunch, perhaps it may have had something to do with his sort of lifelong exposure to lead, um, which, you know, is not going to do you any good in terms of health. Um, if you day to day working with lead, grinding lead, making lead glazes, getting it all over your hands and stuff like that, it may have had some ill effects, uh, health effects from, from that. But I'm just speculating. I don't know for sure. So we have a lot of sources available about uh, Weber's 45-year uh, career. And this is sort of atypical for redware pottery. A lot of redware potters um, operated sort of under the radar. A fair number of them were farmers part-time. Uh, and then when they'd get the crops in, you know, they'd have a little bit of free time. And then they'd throw some pots and that sort of thing and maybe put them in a wagon and drive around the neighborhood selling pottery. And as, as you might expect, a lot of those sorts of businesses uh, are not well documented. You know, we don't have a lot of, uh, you know, business related documents that would show, you know, how much pottery they made or how much they were charging and that sort of thing. Um, so for the, for, to a large extent, um, this, this business is, is uh, not very well known. Um, so, so uh, Christoph Weber's career is, is a bit of an anomaly because we have things like contemporary maps, as you can see here, this is a, portion of the Pickering map from 1824. Now, this is a very detailed map that was made right before the harmonists moved back to Pennsylvania when they were trying to sell the town. Um, and it shows, as you can see here, it says Potter's Furnace. And towards the bottom there, south is towards the bottom, but towards the bottom is Weber's house. 
This is his outbuilding. So all the harmonists had a house and an outbuilding. This is the outbuilding for his, his, his residence. Over here to the north, the northernmost structure is the kiln. Then between that, that circular thing there, I believe is a pit for uh, drying clay that would have had a pug mill in the center, which is just basically like a big box that would have had a uh, uh, some uh, blades in it, like uh, basically like for, for, for mixing the clay and it would have been driven by a horse and these things were circular. And so that's what I think that is. Um, and then below that is his shop to the south of the, the, the mixing area, the clay mixing pug mill um, is his shop. Now, the reason I know this is because, or the reason I suspect uh, which, which uh, structures were which is because this is the, uh, this is the Weingartner map from 1832. And you can see up in the kind of upper left hand side of this map, uh, this is the same thing I just showed you in the previous map, but you can see a southernmost structure there. It says C. Weber, Christoph Weber. And then it says Hefner shop there. That's the potter shop. There's his little outbuilding next to the potter shop. And then to the north, it says Hefner Ofen which means the the kiln, right? And you can see it's got a little chimney sticking out of the top there on the right. Um, and it shows his kiln. Um, it's kind of interesting that it's situated right at the edge of town like that. Um, and probably because it produced a lot of smoke and it was pretty messy and it's not something you'd want to have like right smack dab in the residential areas of the town. Um, we do, we know, know even less about the, the, the pottery operation after they moved from New Harmony. So actually the, 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 the harmonists kept the best records when they were in Indiana for some reason. And then what happened is after they moved back to economy, they sort of petered out in terms of their record keeping. And so we don't have as much information, oddly enough, for the latter years of his pottery operation. But this is a map that John Dust, who was the last uh, uh, leader of the Harmony Society, uh, made of some of the structures and what they were used for. And you can see that arrow, that yellow arrow is where he indicates that the pottery was, but there's never been any excavations there or anything like that. So I don't know a, a heck of a lot about it. Um, so other sources we have on his career. So we've got those maps. Um, other sources that we have are historic documents that, that, that show things like uh, the amounts of supplies that he ordered, how much lead did he order, how much manganese, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, did he order per year? Um, so we can develop a kind of long-term uh, uh, information about that. Uh, we know, for example, for most years, the dollar value of the ceramics that he produced. Uh, in some years, we know the exact dates that he fired the kiln and how often he fired the kiln, how many times a year he did that. Pretty useful stuff. Um, and we also know, uh, in some cases, the percentage of the ceramics that were retained by the Harmony Society. So, you know, he was working primarily as a potter for the society and the 700 people that were living in the town, right? He was making pottery for them and anything he had extra would have been sold outside to uh, non-harmonists in their in their store right um so so it's a pretty it's not perfect we don't have everything but we have a heck of a lot which is uh, more than we can be said is uh for most redware potters so here's for example a couple of the uh documents i've got a whole bunch of these um but there's a lot of documents out there you can see here is this is from the uh potter's account for uh, 1816 and you can see on the left there that's the debit column that's where all the purchases were made and you can see in 1816 january 27th he bought 60 pounds of lead at 15 cents a pound that was nine dollars and then on uh looks like february 17th he bought 50 pounds of manganese at 44 cents a pound that was 22 dollars etc 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 all the way down and then on the right that's the amount that was uh that was uh produced in dollar value so in 1816 he uh produced where sold to the amount of 75 dollars right um this is uh the kiln firings for 1820 so we know in 1820, he fired the kiln on February 18th, April 5th, June 26th, and September 23rd. And we know the dollar values of all those kiln firings. The total that year was $676.10. And that year, $438.92 were for the society, for the members of the Harmony Society. And the remainder, $237.18, was to be sold in the store, right? So 
the other sorts of information we have, we have the pottery itself, right? Um, for New Harmony, the vast majority of information we have about the party's pottery is from archaeological excavation, right? Since the Harmonists took all their stuff when they moved to Pennsylvania, there's not a heck of a lot left in, in New Harmony, so we have to dig it out of the ground, right? Um, so just about anywhere you dig in New Harmony, uh, the oldest portions of the town, at least, you're going to find redware pottery there. So I've done excavations at quite a few different places in town and amassed a fairly decent collection of, of, of ceramics. And, and, you know, they're they're broken and they're in small pieces. So sometimes we can't always tell what vessel this was. Um, but fortunately, uh, we have a whole lot of whole vessels uh, in uh, the old economy collections. There's probably over 100. I don't call the exact number, but it's at least 100. Um, Sarah probably know off the top of her head. But um, there's, a, there's a lot of them. And, and when I first got to see these vessels, when I first made the trip out to economy to study them, I was excited because I said, oh, that's what that is. You know, I'd seen tiny little pieces of it before, but I didn't always know exactly what the whole vessel looked like. So this helped a lot in kind of envisioning in my mind what, what we were seeing in some of the archaeological collections. So here's some other uh, ceramics in the, in the collections at, at Old Economy. We've got some plates with slip trailing on them. We've got some storage jars. You know, that's just a small... Uh, you know, sample of, of what's there is a whole variety of different vessels. So what we wind up with is an almost unprecedented look at a single potter's career, right? Which is, which is great. We, you know, with, with possible exception of the Moravians um, in North Carolina, um, they kept very good records of their, uh, their uh, various businesses and operations as well. Um, and, and, and the thing is, is like, you know, with, with Christoph Weber's operation, it wasn't a usual redware operation. As I said, a lot of people were like farmers or part-time potters and stuff like that. This guy was living in an intentional society and he was producing for this particular group who were all Germans. So it's maybe not a typical redware potter, but hey, I'll take it. You know, it's 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 great source of information. So what have we learned then over the past uh you know, decade or so of lurk working with this 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 pottery. We did three years of excavation at the kiln in New Harmony, which I kind of knew where it was from those maps. We did some magnetometry survey to find the exact spot where the kiln was located, and we opened up a fairly sizable uh, block excavation and uncovered a large chunk of the kiln. Now, unfortunately, part of the kiln um, is underneath. The Lentz House, if you know where that is, for the New Harmony people, they know where it is. But it's underneath the Lentz House, which was plopped down in that spot in the 1950s. Um, and so they put it right on top where the kiln used to be. But uh, a large portion of it was still uh, uh, accessible. Um, now, we know that uh, from, from our excavations that Faber used a German style, not surprising, German style cross draft kiln. And essentially what we're talking about is a kiln that has a firebox at one end and the uh, the uh, gases are channeled in a sort of horizontal direction and vented out a chimney on the other side of the kiln, right? Um, and this is in contrast to a lot of uh, redware kilns that we see in uh, other excavations and, and, and other uh, studies that show that most redware kilns that we have evidence for, especially in, in the Midwest and other places in the United States really, um, tend to be updraft kilns. These are kilns that had fireboxes at the base and the gases were drafted upwards. So his kiln, Vapor's cross draft kiln is, is the only one that I know of off the top of my head that's been identified in the United States, is positively identified in the United States. So that's kind of unique. This is a photo of um, one of our first test units when we were uh, trying to find the kiln. Um, and you can see here that what essentially what you got is about oh, eight or 10 inches of fill dirt that was brought in there and placed on top. And then once you get beyond that fill dirt, you hit kaboom, it's just kiln waste, bricks, vessel fragments, all sorts of stuff. And what happened was, is when the kiln was dismantled after the harmonists left, they gathered up all this 
junk, you know, waste from the kiln and bricks and that kind of thing and threw it into the hole where the kiln used to be. So the whole kiln is just basically filled with with redware fragments and kiln furniture and all sorts of stuff. And you can see there's almost no dirt in between all of these fragments. Um, so this is a, this is, this was typical. We got up, we wound up with a whole lot of stuff. Uh, this is a photo of the kiln uh, excavation. And in the foreground there, you can see this is part of the chimney. It's, it's, the kiln was thoroughly dismantled, right? That's the unfortunate part. It, there wasn't a whole lot in, in place. Uh, but that's a portion of the kiln chimney right there. And then in, towards the back of the photo there, you can see there's like a, a wall going off uh, towards towards the, the, the background of the photo. And uh, that is a foundation wall for something. I think it might have been some type of a building that was adjoining the kiln, like a drying shed or something like that. And we had to stop our excavation because we ran into a sidewalk and we couldn't go any further. So I would have liked to explore where that foundation wall went, but we were kind of limited in our extent because we had a bunch of extant buildings right next to where we were working. Um, and then this is a portion of the excavation um, in the, the firing chamber, the main portion of the kiln. Now I said the kiln was taken apart thoroughly. There was a couple spots and you can see kind of in the middle of the photo, there's a, some bricks down at the bottom uh, of that trench that are still in place. Those are at the base of the kiln, but that was the only spot where we found portion of the kiln that was still in place. You know, they had salvaged the hell out of this thing, right? They took every brick that could have possibly been used and removed it and threw all the broken ones back in. So, so this is an illustration of a, of a kiln that's somewhat similar to the one that we see in New Harmony. It's called a castle kiln. And this is a, from a German uh, uh, publication. Not surprising. And it bears a fair resemblance to the one from uh, New Harmony. You can see on the left of the, the, the drawing there, you've got the firing chamber, or, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the firebox um, where the fuel would have been uh, put in. And, and this fuel, by the way, was all, it was, it was wood fired. There's no evidence, zero evidence for use of coal or anything like that. It was a wood fired kiln. So they fear the wood in there. And then the, in that main area there is where all the vessels would be stacked. And then you can see it just goes in a horizontal direction and gets vented out the chimney towards the top. Uh, here's a photo. This is from an archaeology report, a German archaeology report of an excavation of a kiln like that. Um, and you can kind of see what I'm talking about. Again, you get the firebox on the right, the firing chamber, and then the chimney on the left there. All right. All right. So what do we see in terms of the changes through time in terms of, uh, you know, Weber's wares that he was producing. So, you know, because we've got such a long period of time, you know, almost 50 years of the manufacture of the ceramics, we can get kind of a long-term viewpoint of how he may have changed. And we can see some changes. Um, for example, uh, on the left, there is a type of picture that he was making more in the earlier years. You'll see a type, you'll see these kinds of pictures in New Harmony. Um, and this is a kind of a low slung picture with, uh, with, uh, sort of a dark kind of chocolate brown lead glaze on the interior and exterior. And then on the right, you'll see a, you can see a vessel that was made probably in his later years. What he was doing, the, the vessel form changes a little bit. It's more kind of barrel shaped, but what he tended to do with his pictures in the latter years of, uh, his manufacturing them was he would make them, uh, he would coat them with like a white slip, which is just kind of like a clay mixed to a milky consistency. And when he would coat the vessel with this white slip, and then he would glaze it on the exterior with a glaze that had copper in it to give it that green color. So he would put the white down first, and that would help to bring out the green color of the green glaze. You almost never see that in New Harmony. We, you know, we did excavations, like I said, at the kiln. We found tens of thousands of redware shirts, and I think maybe three, five, perhaps, were of this green type. Um, so that's it's not found at all, really, in New Harmony. So this has got to be a later thing. Um, it is another example of some changes through time. The one on the left there is a is a reconstructed, you can see it was broken, reconstructed storage jar from the Wolf House excavations. Um, and um, in New Harmony, he typically only glazed the vessels on the interior. Um, whereas when he moved to economy, he started glazing them on the exterior as well. And I think that had to do 
with the fact that, you know, in 1820 in Southwest Indiana, we were in a somewhat frontier situation. It was a little difficult perhaps to get supplies, things like lead. And so he felt like he didn't want to waste it. It was just there to make the interior uh, uh, waterproof and easier to clean. So why put it on the outside? You don't hundred percent need it on the outside. Whereas when he went to Pennsylvania, he probably felt a little bit more free to you know, make him look a little bit nicer and, and glaze the exteriors as well. Right. So there's a little bit of change there. Um, we see a fair number of new vessel forms once they go back to Pennsylvania. Um, this one, for example, you don't do not see this at all in new harmony, um, broken or otherwise. Uh, this is a kind of a baking dish. There's a number of these in the collections in uh, in old economy, um, and some of them are charred on the or they have evidence of soot on the bottom. So we can be fairly well sure that they were used in baking. Um, but you never see this in New Harmony. So th this might have been something just as simple as somebody saying like, "Hey, you know, could you make a vessel like this?" for baking, like with a flat bottom and kind of circular with some handles on the side. And he's like, sure, I'll have a go. I'll make one of these. And then he made one and somebody said, yeah, I, I'd like to have one of those too. So, you know, he started making them for people in the town and, you know, that's how it started. It doesn't have to be anything uh, more complicated than that, you know. Um, these are also not found in New Harmony. These are it looks like a bunt pan, you know, it had been for like making jellies or cakes or something like that. And essentially what he did was he threw a bowl like vessel and then he cut a hole in the bottom and affixed this conical piece to the center. And then he took his fingers and like basically pushed in the sides of the vessel to make it kind of that ribbed exterior look like that. So there's a whole bunch of these, not a whole bunch, five, seven, I don't remember the exact number from economy, but you would never find this in um, in uh, in New Harmony. And then there are some weird ones that I don't 100% know what they are. There's this one, for example. Um, it kind of looks like a muffin pan, but if you see it in real life, the holes are much too small and much too shallow uh, for that purpose. Um, you know, uh, basically what he did was he cut some guidelines into the surface of the of the piece uh, and then he drilled out some cylindrical holes in it and then glazed it uh, and honestly I don't know what it was used for so it's an interesting little oddity here's another one that I'm not 100% sure what it is you can see it's just basically kind of a trough like piece it's maybe about if I remember right just a couple feet long um, it's glazed on the inside it kind of looks like a planter for like planting flowers or something like that, but it wouldn't have been good for that because it's glazed on the inside. You don't want to glaze the inside of a flower pot. Um, so I think it might have been used for something like watering chickens or something like that. Yeah, but we don't know for sure. Just a guess. So there's, like I said, in some ways, Vapor did change what he did over time. Uh, but in other ways, he was really conservative uh, in his, uh, in his uh, vessels that he made. Um, for example, these are the ones on the left are from New Harmony, and it's based. These are, are shirts from a, a serving bowl of some kind. Um, they're decorated with slip trailing, um, and uh, you know the the ones that you find in New Harmony are virtually identical things to things that you'll find in Economy. So this is a, like I said, a serving bowl. It's something a little bit fancier. This is something would have been placed on the table more more uh, likely than not. Um, and he simply didn't change this one. He just kept churning these things out for decades, right? The, similarly, the jugs that he made are pretty similar depending on whether it's in New Harmony or in Economy. The one on the left is from the Wolf House excavations, whereas the one on the right is from Economy. Um, and another thing he did not change uh, was uh, he pretty much didn't go with the trends in uh, pottery manufacture and, and consumer, uh, uh, what would you call it, consumer tastes over time. Uh, so what happened beginning around, you know, in the 1830s, 1840, um, consumers really didn't want redware anymore, right? It's very fragile. You bump that thing, you knock it off the table, you bang two redware pieces together, you're going to have broken redware on your hands. You know, think about just banging two, two uh, flower pots together. They're going to crack relatively easily. Um, and so uh, what happened was is that uh, stoneware becomes 
more uh, desired by consumers. Now, this is a type of uh, uh, pottery that's, um, again, very utilitarian, but it's made with a different kind of clay that has to be fired at a higher temperature. It's harder to find this clay. It's glazed in a different way. They would throw salt into the kiln um, and, um, and it's, it, uh, it, it's a salt would vaporize and the silica would coat the outside of the pots and that sort of thing. So it's a kind of a whole different process. The temperatures are different. The kiln is different. The clays are different. And apparently Weber was not willing to kind of start over and learn this whole new way of doing things. He was kind of like, it seems like he was probably kind of fixed in the way I'm going to make red, red weird till the day I die, right? You know, is it? and he didn't uh, make that jump to stoneware. He wasn't the only one though. A lot of potters, uh, did not adapt in that way. Um, some of the redware potters stopped making vessels and they started making flower pots and, and roofing tiles and drainage tiles and stuff like that, which is essentially redware, but it's not a vessel, right? Um, so they just kind of shifted gears a little bit and started making different forms. But a lot of potters just never made that jump to stoneware because like I said, it was just kind of a big change in technology, et cetera. Um, so there you go. There's a Redware, redware uh, pit, uh, pitcher on the left that, that Faber made, and then you've got a stoneware pitcher on the right, and he never made that jump. All right, so a few numbers here. Um, I'll just kind of show you some trends over time. Um, you know, we, we hear a lot about the harmonist self-sufficiency and the fact that they were making everything that they possibly could and only buying things that they couldn't make. And to a large extent, this seems to be the case when it comes to uh, to, to pottery. Um, when we can see here, now this is data from 1818 to 1824. So this is the new Harmony decade in Indiana. And you can see that this is, this is showing the percent of the pottery that was retained by the Harmony Society. So that stayed in town, right? And you can see anywhere from about 55 to almost 80% of the pottery that Weber made was used by society members. Right. So this was largely a, an industry that was designed to serve the needs of the society. Right. And I suppose anything that was just kind of left over, then, you know, that would go over to the to the store. Right. So, yes, like I said, extra wares were sold in the harmonist store. So um, this is data from 1816 to 1834. So it bridges two towns. You got New Harmony on the left and you got Economy on the right. And you can see. Uh, what's going on here is that things start out somewhat low, 1816, 1870, and then 1817, and then demand for uh, redware pottery goes up throughout the Harmony decade, and then it starts to go down towards the end, right? And then once they move to economy, it goes even lower than that, right? So as you get into the 1830s, there's seemingly relatively little demand for redware, and that's Again, what I think is going on there is that the consumers didn't want that stuff. They wanted, well, first of all, uh, Staffordshire fancy pottery made in England for the table and that sort of thing. And for their storage needs, for their you know utilitarian needs, they were starting to prefer uh, stoneware. So redware was just kind of the whole industry was a bit going down the tubes uh, by that point in time. You can kind of see it there. Um, so this is just another expression of that whole uh, phenomenon um, where the, um, and it's just another way of measuring it, but um, this is the expenses for the raw materials, right? So like I said, we know how much lead he bought and manganese and brimstone, that is sulfur uh, for, for various things that he was doing with the redware pottery. And you can see in Harmony, Pennsylvania, before they came to Indiana, the expenses go up, 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 they peak, and then they start to go down in the new harmony decade and throughout economy, they're relatively low uh, throughout that period. So that just kind of, again, shows this, this change in consumer preference for, you know, biased in some sense against, uh, against redware. I like redware. I'm not biased against it. Um, so over time, there was less demand outside that is from consumers who are non-harmonists, but there was also less demand within the society. So we know that um, through time, there were fewer and fewer harmonists, right? They're not marrying, um, they're not having children, and those members that are in the society are either dying or leaving in the case of the schism in 1832. So 
over time, we've got fewer and fewer households that are need, need uh, pottery. And you can pretty much see what's going on here. You know, we've got, uh, this is during the economy years. This is from 1827 to 1853. And it starts out decent demand for redware pottery. And then it peters out to virtually nothing by 1853. I think in 1853, he produced like $10 worth of redware, which is, you know, I mean, these things were cheap, but $10 is still a really low number of vessels that were uh, sold um, and used within the society. So it's, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's pretty much over by that point in time. So, so to kind of wrap it up here, you know, over his career, it seems that, that Weber was sort of selectively responsive to changes in vessel shapes and forms. Like I said, in some instances, he would start making a new thing that he hadn't made before. And in other cases, he kind of stuck to his guns and continued to make a certain type over and over decade, decade, decade after decade, you know. Um, and then he wasn't willing to make that jump over to stoneware. And as I said, that wasn't atypical. So, uh, but by 1840 or so, when stoneware was taking over, he was already 56 years old. I mean, he was the same age as me. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I'd want to start a new career or just kind of start over again in, in my, my uh, pottery making knowledge uh, by that point in time. And, and uh, you know, maybe it was getting to the point where he was kind of ready to hang it up anyways, because uh, production was dwindling to virtually nothing by 1853. And by that time, he was 69 years old, and he may have been ready to, you know, retire, whatever form that would have taken within the Harmony Society. Um, but uh, he did live another, what, eight years um, before he died. Um, so I'm not sure what he was doing, doing during that time, but he doesn't appear to have been making pottery. At least I don't see any evidence for it. So uh, thank you for coming and, and listening to what I have to say. Um, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have um, if I am able to answer those questions. So. If you want to just ask away and just unmute and. Where, where could he have acquired the stoneware clay? Was it nearby? Yeah. Where could he have gotten clay for stoneware manufacturing? If he had decided to, you know, um, I, I don't, I don't actually know. I mean, there was a big stoneware manufacturing industry in Beaver County where they moved to after they left uh, left New Harmony, left the, after they left Indiana. So presumably, the clay would have been nearby. I don't know a lot about the stoneware industry there, but there, it was a big area for stoneware manufacturing. So presumably it was relatively close by unless you want to haul clay over long distances, which is usually not viable, you know, economically. Hey, Mike, uh, boy, I really enjoyed this uh, talk tonight. Uh, Good, thanks. I'm, I'm sorry I had my camera off, as I mentioned today. I was uh -huh. uh, chopping onions and whatnot. Okay. But, but, <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to see you anyway, so. <laughs> I, I, and, I, and I wasn't crocheting, but <laughs> shout out to the crocheters among us. Yeah, uh, finished. <laughs> with that. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, so I, I was really um, interested in uh, what what you learned during this project because at several points it struck me that you would have been a historian or um, a ceramicist. I mean, you know a lot about ceramics. Uh, what, what? So what did you have to learn new to uh, finish this project? Oh, well, you know, archaeologists are jack, jacks of all trades anyways. <laughs> you know, we have to know a little bit about a lot of different things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, maybe step a little bit on the toes of the historian with all the, his the documents that we have to look at. Um, I, you know, honestly, I don't throw pottery. I am not a potter. I've done it a few times. But other than that, I had to uh, consult with people who do make pottery like al holen at usi i did ask her a number of times like if what i was saying was making sense <laughs> you know as far as like the the kiln and how i was interpreting it and all that sort of thing and then there was another potter um uh in uh, posey county and i asked him a lot of times about about the manufacture of the pottery um tom winsack is his name and uh, he makes reproduction well not reproduction but he makes 
redware, the equivalent of redware pottery. So he knows a lot about the whole industry. So it certainly helped to talk to people who do this, you know, hands-on sort of stuff um, to make sure that I was not, my, my interpretations were not all in left field. So yeah, like I said, you'd, you have to know a lot about a lot, a, a little about a lot of different things to, in order to do archaeology. So, uh, th this is Link Luddington. Uh, am I correct in my my belief that the uh, the, the the characteristics of the clay that would be used in in uh, production of redware pottery are substantially similar to the the clay that was used in brick making? Mm -hmm. and I, I'm curious about uh, whether you you or anyone else you're aware of uh has done research or uh, has uh, any knowledge of uh the brick making industries both in the harmonies period and and then in in the later periods in new harmony or that area in the 19th I, century I, I personally haven't done anything with brick making i know where the brick making uh areas were it was like in the south west corner of town i think it's in private property now but I mean, I'm sure, sure that something could be done there. I mean, I assume the clay sources were nearby. They're right by the Wabash River, so they probably could have dug clay somewhere nearby. I've been told there was a clay pit um, at the north end of town, and that might have been where he was getting his clay. But I don't have any, you know, independent confirmation of that. But yeah, I haven't really looked into brick making. I do have some samples of raw clay that I've taken, like basically what the harmonists did when they were building when they're constructing buildings if they they would use these you know uh, uh sandstone blocks and they would put like raw clay in between them instead of mortar so when they were building the and you may know this i don't know but they would put clay in between the blocks and so as i was you know doing various uh work like at some of the community house like community house one we pull off this big block and it'd be covered with clay and like oh this is the raw clay so i took some samples of it but i have never done any kind of analysis of it or anything like that uh that would tell me maybe perhaps where they'd gotten it or something like that so i do have samples though well and you may I mean, you may already be aware that uh in the uh if fauntleroy house and el elsewhere in the uh, uh buildings i'm aware of uh they're owned by or operated by the Indiana State Museum of Historic Sites. Yeah. There are examples of of unfired, literally unfired, uh, clay bricks that were left over from the uh, harmonist period of construction, hmm. uh, even after the even after the Fauntleroy House was uh, remodeled and modernized in the eighteen forties and and later. Hmm. No, I haven't seen those. Um, if they, yeah, I've done some work around the Fauntleroy House area, but I've never seen those bricks. That's well, we interesting. To... Sorry. I sorry. I um at economy they were um they weren't using bricks right away when they were building the town because their brick makers weren't at economy yet. Mm. They just had um the carpenters and the masons. Mm -hmm. Everyone was left in, in New Harmony. And but when they finally did get the brick makers, supposedly it was set up east of economy and that's really confusing because i thought that they got their clay from the river which hmm. the river is kind of far down from economy you know it's it's a big drop off mm -hmm. i don't know i really don't know where they got their clay from yeah when you're saying that they that the brick makers didn't go to economy right away there there is a lull in the action with the redware manufacturer yes. and i always had a suspicion that was because they didn't have the bricks yet you know he would have needed a large quantity of bricks to build the kiln and if there was no brick making going on yet i mean i suppose they probably could have bought some bricks but you know they were averse to doing those things if they could make them themselves um and so it, it took i think a little while to get things in place before he was able to resume pottery making yeah, yeah that would make sense because they, they were using the clay for brick making yeah okay so Michael, did you notice any difference in the bricks from the kiln itself as opposed to, I don't know, bricks that would have been made for the house? The ones that we found from our kiln are much larger and they're lighter. They're not as heavy and they don't look like they were, uh, they're lighter in color. And they're just, they're just really different. And I just wondered if those kilns that you found, those bricks you found at the bottom of the kiln were different in well, any other way? They're the same. I mean, I haven't, I guess I'd have to measure them and just double check, but just visually they look similar. They're they're 
really soft brick, you know, that's they were very soft. Ours are very soft, but they're remarkably larger. And really? uh, yeah, very but and they're just they just feel lighter, you know. Really? And then they had they were at the base of the kiln and then there was layers of ash over the top of it and, mm -hmm. and charcoal over the top of it, but they were laid flat on the bottom. But we've got a Charles Hawkins Smith came in and was just fascinated by them. But you know, we've got uh he, you know uh a, he, he did a study of it, but they're they're really different than the than the house brick. Okay. Yeah, as far as I, I can tell, the same. Um yeah, visually they look the same. I okay. Never any... Where where is that other um dig? And uh, the one I did, uh we're in Louisville, J Town, right outside of Louisville. It's the same time period, 1801, maybe to 1837 mm -hmm. or so. Uh, not a harmonist, but you know, uh, okay. a local farmer potter. But was well, he tra trained with the yeah. Arabians? Yeah, this is Link Lodisky again. I'm I'm not sure where you're referring to, but uh, when you when you use the term house brick, there was no single house brick as such because okay. the the bricks that were the the hired fired hardest, uh, and therefore more weatherproof, were used on exterior surfaces. Okay. And the salmon or punk, pumpkin or whatever you want to call the softer fired brick uh, were used on interior wall surfaces where they didn't have to withstand weather. Mm -hmm. But th those are wow. those are both distinct from uh, un literally unfired, uh, just rock clay brick, like I was referring to earlier, mm -hmm. that the harmonists actually used in uh, in wall fill uh, construction in various. And would those buildings. have been different sizes? The inside. Well, I mean, and, and, and the whole the whole question of. Uh, brick sizes is i mean th there was no there was nothing standardized in the 19th century i mean each mm -hmm. each individual brick maker had his own molds and uh, you know when you look at the, tradi the differences in traditions of for example english tradition versus german as, as already been pointed out uh th there was no standardization in uh, the brick making industry i mean aside from the just the the practices i mean the the, the idea of you know, pugging and, and molding brick and, you know, making the brick and molding, them, drying them and firing them. But, uh, okay. Well, at the same to... site, we did a very marked difference in the ones in the kiln and the ones from the house. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we have a couple of questions in the, in the chat. Um, oh, okay. yeah. One is, uh, are the redware vessels marked in some way? Uh, if you know, <laughs> it's the answer. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, there are a few that have like capacity markings, either like under the glaze or scratched into the glaze. Um, and those are all at economy, uh, at old economy. I don't have seen anything like that in, in new harmony, but, um, for the most part, no, they're not marked in any way. Uh, they're not uh, he never signed anything. I mean, you know, this guy, he considered himself a, uh, a, a craftsman, you know, it was a, it was a job. He was turning these things out as fast as he could probably. Um, so he didn't consider himself an artist. And you have anything. to talk about EW. Oh, the EW shirt. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll mention that. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting one. I talk about it in the book, you know, a little cheap plug for the book, but, um, like when we were doing excavations, um, we did find a little, it was a bottom of a vessel. It was very small and it was very kind of crudely made. You can tell it wasn't expert hands that did this, but there were some initials in the bottom of the shirt and they were kind of scratched into the bottom and it's and it was EW. And, you know, it took me a few minutes to think about what was going on there. And uh, it, his, his son's name was Elias Weber. And so I think that's what was happening was his son, who would have been, I think, seven when they arrived in New Harmony. He was probably either learning the craft. We know that he did learn the pottery making art. Um, and uh, maybe when he was younger, he was helping out his father or something like that. He made a little vessel of some kind and he put his name on the bottom, just like you'd expect kids to do. You know, this one's mine. It's got my initials on the bottom. And then when they fired it, it broke. <laughs> and <laughs> one shirt from the bottom there wound up in the in that in that pit that we found. So, you know, with archaeology, it's often very difficult to tie a specific artifact to a specific person you know there's this kind of anonymity sometimes about the artifacts 
Um, and in this case, we could tell that this was something that I, a known individual uh, made, which was kind of fun. You know, I can also talk about his son and what happened to his son. That's kind of a fun story. Um, his son, uh, he uh, left New Harmony, just like all the harmonists, and he went to Pennsylvania. And then a, about a year and a half later, he decided he didn't want to be a harmonist anymore. And he stole a boat along with two other two other young men. And they floated that boat down the Ohio River all the way back to New Harmony and um, just kind of went AWOL on the, amongst the Harmony Society. And um, so what happened was uh, the, the, the people back in, in economy were worried about them and they sent somebody down the river to find those three boys. Um, and they wound up finding all three of them. Uh, one of them was sick and living, uh, geez, I can't remember, maybe Mount Vernon, if I remember right. <laughs> um, and another one, I think, was in New Harmony. And both of them were willing to go back, right? They were like, oh, we made a mistake. You know, they were like, we want to go back home. And then Elias never went back. He he was in, he went to Albion in Illinois, and he was set up with a kiln uh, by uh, George Flower, who was uh, one of the founders of uh, Albion, Illinois. Um, and apparently he knew Elias through their dealings with the Harmony Society. And he set him up with a kiln. He said, okay, you know, you can make some pottery in, in, in my town. And then when the Harmony Society members said like, hey, come back, he said, you know, no, I'm not going. And that was the end of it. He never went back. Um, and eventually what happened was uh, he decided he didn't want to do pottery and he decided to be a, a construct do construction and be a builder. And he built a number of buildings in uh, in the town, uh, a couple of which still stand today. So um, and I don't know if he ever corresponded back with his father or anything like that. But after Elias left, um, you know, Christoph was all by himself, you know, essentially like um his wife had died. His son left the society. He still had in-laws or his former in-laws in town with him, uh, Maria's uh, siblings and that sort of thing. But his immediate family was no longer there. So, well, just one more story. question from the chat, and this kind of bridges off of that. But uh, mm -hmm. do you know if uh, Weber was the only potter working in the Harmonist towns? Uh, there are some indications that there might have been a couple other individuals who would there was one guy who came early on whose who's, uh, uh, occupation was listed as potter, but I have no indication that he actually practiced pottery making in town. And there was a couple other people that kind of zipped in and out uh, that may have assisted here and there, uh, perhaps with, with the pottery making, including his Weber son. Mm -hmm. um, but um, other than that, no, I don't you know he was the he was the guy for that entire 45 year period who was making pottery as far as i know and then we've got one more question that just popped up uh mm -hmm. do you know why people started leaving the group oh it's complicated <laughs> well people were trickling in and in and out of the group uh for some time um you know over the decades because people were dissatisfied with the kind of strict lifestyle of the Harmony Society. And so people would leave here and there. But in 1832, um, there was this uh, fellow from Germany who uh, uh, he considered himself to be a prophet. He shows up in New Harmony. And, and the Harmonists were this millennialist group. They believed that the second coming of Christ was imminent and that you know it would all be over with. And they were trying to set up a model society in uh, in in. Uh, in, in anticipation of this event. And then when this fellow showed up from Germany claiming to be a prophet and they were sort of preparing, gearing up like, hey, you know what, this is it. This is, you know, the final thing we've been anticipating. And then Rapp, the leader of the Harmony Society became dissatisfied with him. He thought, you know, this guy seems like a bit of a charlatan. And um, so there was a schism and part of the, about a third of the members of the Harmony Society went with this this Bernhard Muller fellow, and then the remainder of them stayed with the Harmony Society. So um, that was the the big schism of 1832 that uh, that I referred to earlier. And that was that economy. You yeah. said new economy. Did mm -hmm. I? Did I? Okay, yes. economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was also known as Count de Leon. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was basically a con man, as far as I can tell. <laughs> yeah, and he he was going to be sued by uh, the former harmonists, and he escaped the night before his trial in on September second, eighteen thirty three, and and escaped to go to uh, Louisiana. And there's a historic site for him in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's an interesting fellow. Other questions? All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming again. Appreciate uh, people spending their evening here listening to my Redware talk. Yes. Um. Thank you. And uh, just stay tuned for next year's offerings. Uh, we'll be advertising those uh, early next year uh, on social media. So got some great things lined up. And thanks for coming. Have a good evening. Great mm-hmm. talk. Enjoyed it. Thanks, Mark.